So, we continue with the historic cities and heritage areas. Remember in our last lecture, we have been talking about declaration of Amsterdam, Nairobi declaration. So, today we will continue with some of the specific examples. Uh, we have talked about the principles of the Nairobi, uh, where we talked about the relationship of the part and the concept of the whole and the, the importance of the administrative and other and also the importance of the human activities. So, what is the definition? The definition uh, it talks about the historic areas is the historical and architectural inclusive vernacular areas shall be taken to mean any groups of buildings, structures and open spaces including archaeological and paleontological sites constituting human settlements in an urban or rural environment, the cohesion and value of which from the archaeological, architectural, prehistoric, historic aesthetic or sociocultural point of view are recognized. So, it, it gives a wide panorama. It is talking about archaeology, is talking about architecture, is talking about prehistoric layers, is talking about both urban and rural development, is talking about the groups of buildings, structures and open spaces. You remember in York, uh, how the Jorvik Viking Museum came about is before the Roman inhabitation, there were these uh, Vikings who came and they found the settlements there. That was an unique example where that has been preserved as a museum in the basement and on, on the surface it is a commercial area with some limitation because it cannot go very high rise and other, but it is a living city and both the prehistoric archaeological remains and the contemporary activities are simultaneously going. And, but there are also may be situation where prehistoric ruins are there and it has to be preserved that way, but it can be integrated. So, this is the definition when it is talking about the safeguarding and contemporary role of the historic areas in the Nairobi declaration. We have sometimes mentioned about the split in crash here, which is a world heritage site in historic complex. And if you look at the split, uh, the city of the split is it is important because of the Roman remains which is there. Uh, now, when we talk about split, it is actually a, a very uh, large urban area it known for its shipyard and also tourism is one of the major activities. And uh, so, this is the this is the boundary of the old city core. And this is very large area and this is the it is along the sea coast is very important, but now when it is it has to become a part it has become a part of a larger area part of the integrated master plan and this area where what we are seeing here is actually it is on the boundary of the old area just outside the wall. And we are coming into this transition area, which also has a layers of history like Venetian architecture and the neoclassical architecture. And all of this make this transition to the modern area very smooth in terms of activity, in terms of scale, uh, in terms of architecture, in terms of the movement, because the old city core is totally pedestrian. When we are coming here, some sort of a vehicular control is there, but there is a control there or these are allowed. And as you can see here that it is a part of a larger city area. Now, we are talking about redefining the role that old area which was there, it is functioning, it is very important in tourism, but it also fun act, there are many offices are there, there are shopping areas, there are uh, uh, homestays there. Yeah, there are academic institutions there. So, it is not only developed for the tourism, it is it, it is also serving uh, a part of the university. Uh, there are a lot of museums also there, 
uh, even within the uh, old area there are the religious structure you can see that. So, it is serving a purpose it, it has a role in the modern area and this is the transition phase that what we are talking about we see that area is important and so what is the issue when we are talking of certain uh, of these historic areas. It is uh, it's not a very because it is a larger area it we are talking about the changing we are talking about redefining the role uh, we are talking about not freezing uh, the development, but uh, allowing changes. So, issue is that the modern urbanization is considerable increase in the scale and density of building. As I say that there is a sharp contrast into the scale of activities movement and the built form of that area uh, to that modern urbanization, uh, which is really talking about the increase in scale and density of the building and it is very drastic. And another issue is that the loss of traditionally established visual integrity of the built environment activities people are important also important is the visual scale uh, which is there if it is there we have to find out what is that and what is the integrity we are talking about the visual um, traditionally established visual integrity of the built environment what is the characteristic or what are the components of that and it may vary from place it will definitely vary from place to place. Let us take this example auto bioad market from York city. As you can see in the foreground, there are the these probably were the residential houses. Now it is converted into a very busy commercial area. This is absolutely fine. The change is being accommodated. There must be internal changes within the buildings. A lot of uh, rehabilitation being done. But what is it's not desirable is that huge structure that that the increase in scale uh, which is happening here. So this is something which is changing the traditionally established visual integrity of the built environment. So, what, what do you do that on one hand we are talking about allowing the change, another hand we are talking about no this is not desirable. How this is possible? It is possible. How it is possible? Let us see. Ensure that views from and two monuments and historic areas are not spoiled and that historic areas are integrated harmoniously into the contemporary life. So, this is I think is a very good example in the same byword market. What has happened is that you can see that a new activity because it is it, it's a, a new uh, the, it is revived the market area and it needs parking. So, I think this is a multi storied parking this is my conjecture that this structure has come up which is higher in scale, but it is not that drastic and not inharmonious uh, with that uh, like the earlier example like this one. This sort of merges harmoniously, but still you can make out that it is from the contemporary time. It probably is as a uh, I, I presume that it is a multi storied parking area because when you are talking about commercial area you need the cars to come there you need the parking area. So, it is in it is increased in height, but it has some sort of it is like establishing a dialogue between the old and the new and I think this has done, but how it has been done it is just a decision of individual architect that or a property developer it cannot be done that way. Here the administrative the uh, the role of the administration policy guidelines strategies rules and bylaws are very important to make this happen. So, let us talk about this that how it has been made possible. In 1991 February 6 the city council of Ottawa voted unanimously to create the Byward market heritage conservation district. So, we are getting the term the conservation district heritage area whatever say heritage city. So, it has a heritage conservation district has been established there which has its own boundary which has to have its own bylaws. And so, these delineation and uh, declaration of that legally has to be done. The area comprised of 50 acres of prime downtown real estate 
including 15 city blocks and 160 separate buildings. So, we are talking about a real estate area, a prime downtown area and this is the 50 years that it was an old picture of that where it was happened because of the initiative of the local people and the city authority. In 1991, a corresponding bylaw passed and subsequently approved by the Ontario Municipal Board. So, the local authority is become playing a very important role there. 2005 update of the Ontario Heritage Act. Now, this Ontario Heritage Act is for a larger area uh, that Ontario as a larger area where the guidelines were established. So, this took the advantage of that Ontario Heritage Act which is a legal instrument to establish the guidelines. To address the new development in the district, so what were the guidelines for? To address the new development, so you remember that the new what I say uh, sympathetic development which has happened and that can happen only when these acts, tools, uh, legal things are there and the guidelines are established. The guidelines can, these are guidelines, one cannot design, uh, uh, give the design of a new structure. So, certain flexibility also has to be there that how this new development should come up. Provide a minimum form of design, con this is very important. I have seen areas where there is a very strict design control and then you get a very, uh, I mean, not so good examples, it looks just a copy imitation and other thing. To allow the creativity of architects and innovative ideas in terms of experimentation with material and form, but within certain guidelines you need to have a design control, but it cannot be a very stringent design control. So, you are saying a provide a minimum form of design control and there has to be a process that who will review that and how that happens. Now, let us talk about that we are talking about the views from and the monuments and historic areas and how do we understand the views. Let us take another example, uh, a case of from uh, the same area from Canada, but another city Toronto, the case of Queens Park and assembly building. So, this is a very important structure which has its own history, you can see the uh, the background stories in the references which I will be giving. And so, this is a very important historic part, it is set in a landscape area in a park. Now, this is in a downtown area, a lot of development is happening very close to the university downtown area. Now, if the high rises comes in that area surrounding the structure, should towers be visible behind the Queen's Park? What will be the height of those towers? What will the form? because we are talking about not freezing the development. So, what will happen? So, a very interesting analysis has been done on that, so which I will be referring. Approaches for identifying and protecting the significant view. So, one has to understand that like in this particular case, this spine is very important. Uh, this spine what you see here that spine from here, the different spines were identified from where this structure is visible and it can be from many sides and this actually form the view cone. So, approaches for identifying and protecting significant views and now with advanced computer modeling, uh, it makes relatively simple to view what and uh, have the simulation to what will be the impact of that. And uh, I have given the reference that where the heritage impact assessment has been done for a view control study for Queen's Park and Ontario heritage things. Uh, so, what in this study has been developed is the visual integrity scale, uh, aggregate levels of visual integrity for the building silhouette. So, what it has been done here, it has developed a scale, it has taken a silhouette of the building and try to see that from the various view angles that what should be the development which comes behind that building and it sh what is the impact of that. For example, this one the condition 1 is the high visual integrity where fully legible silhouette. So, uh, here what is being done is that they are saying that if because this is the silhouette of the building, uh, this actually is a significant characteristic. So, if buildings come up to this, then it is of the condition 1 which is the uh, high visual integrity because it is not really disrupting that. 
then it is talking about condition 2 because it has found out that what are the features and it is now you see that the height is like this. So, it is coming up, up almost up to this. So, it is almost diluting or uh, overlapping the distinctiveness of this form. So, it is the moderate visual integrity silhouette obscured up to the ditch line. So, one has to take the structure and find out that what are the significant features. In the condition 3 what you see that the high the buildings have come up to this level. So, only this this tower is only visible. So, it is the minimum visual integrity because it has almost uh, taken these the it distinctiveness of this part is totally gone and the condition for it is up to this much where the local visual uh, lost visual integrity. So, this scale this is a systematic way. So, it has to be done from the various view angles uh, from where this monument is uh, visible and with the different simulation one can objectively decide that what will be the height or and what are the forms which is a sort of a which will be permissible and these for each and every area it can be developed. And these types of heritage impact assessment visually for the visual scale uh, can be developed for the sites where one can prescribe that what will be the new development. And it, it cannot be uniform from all sites there has to be a variation based on a proper analysis. So, this was talking about the visual integrated scale, but there are also other legal and administrative measures which are also necessary to make this possible. The application of an overall policy for safeguarding historic areas and their surrounding should be based on principles which are valid for the whole of each country. As a country wise we have seen even Ontario there is a heritage act in India we should have an act we will talk about that later on which is applicable for the entire region. Uh, and depending on the characteristics of the aims and this is principally. Public authorities as well as individual must be obliged to comply with the measures for safeguarding. So, there must be some obligation legally and policy wise and an administrative tool wise. However, machinery for appeal against arbitrary or unjust decision should also be provided. So, there also should be some case or uh, possibility of appeal uh, and uh, so it, it must go through a review process uh, there has to be some possibilities uh, it is not like in a one person's opinion and others it has to as I say the this process of reviewing process of appeal all these things must be integrated when we, we devise the policy for these types of areas. So, these are the article 9 and article 13 of the Nairobi recommendations. It also continues in article 18, a list of historic areas and their surroundings to be protected should be drawn up at national, regional and local claim. This enlisting is very, very important because and this listing must be gadgeted, it is not just inventory and putting it somewhere. These one is a listing done, there is a process of listing of the individual structure, heritage uh, areas and historic areas, open spaces. So, there has to be a proper inventory and then this listing must be done through a legal process gadgeted, so that it becomes a legal uh, document. A standard procedure in many countries starting from England example Bath, Germany, Romanesque, Strasse and France each with somewhat different legal implications. So, each region, each area for if you talk about India we have to have an overarching for a national policy national act, but then within that the individual areas should be addressed. So, there can be the local city wise bylaw, city wise regulations to take care of that. So, let us see how these different countries each depending on their own focus principles have developed and that is why we are still able to see some of the beautiful historic areas which are still preserved and still leaving. For example, Bath. Bath has a legally delineated and protected heritage area which is a world heritage site. So, you can see that there is a legal boundary which has been earmarked and this definition of the boundary or delineation of that is not only is legally accepted, but under certain act 
but it has there has to be a process for delineating that area and bath is also not only the roman bath and the roman areas it also is a beautiful example of these christians uh, the housings uh, which de were developed that time along with this uh, green areas and the uh, open spaces and these all have been preserved due to this legal tool which has been possible and the layers of history have been preserved and lived in. This is Romanistrasse's or Romantic street uh, in Germany where the timber structures are there, there are beautiful landmarks. You can see the, the paving pattern of the streets are there, there are the shops, hotels, homestays. People live in those areas, there are timber uh, buildings, timber framework buildings, there are the buildings with the lime plaster, the sloping roofs of a different material and I am sure that some of the buildings are new in fill in that area. And this is, is possible because of the administrative and legal tools uh, uh, which has been instituted there. This is another example from France, Strasbourg, where there is a canal and there are again beautiful structures in that. Here also we see that there is a legally defined area. So, when we are talking about a law, rules and regulation, we have to and which is different from the rest of the city, we have to say that where these uh, laws, special laws or special bylaws will be uh, implemented. So, we see that there is a delineation which has happened there and this is based on a certain process and understanding. So, that these bylaws which are happening here is definitely different from the rest of the city and that is why we see that these beautiful canals and other. And if you very really see clearly, I am sure that this structure what you see here is a, a new structure. And this is possible, it has been made possible because of these rules and regulations which have been implemented. But this definition of the historic area, legal definition and enlisting is a very important part of these types of controls. Another example, I mean uh, we are the main street program in North America, each and every country, each and every region has its own approach and uh, gives different emphasis, different types of tools and uh, legal uh, policies and guidelines. So, the main street projects in North America is another one which is very important, you see the logo. It is based on the invitation of the building owners and particularly the commerce to invest in the historizing the innovation of the house fronts along principal still in the urban center. So, this is a, a, a pan American uh, feature where many of these uh, principal streets uh, urban centers have been commercialized where it is uh, involving the local people and the, uh, uh, the local stakeholders is a program of the National Main Street Center, revitalize the older and historic commercial district to build a vibrant neighborhoods and thriving economy. So, that is their motto and uh, there are lot of examples because when it is a uh, commercially viable, uh, but not only for tourists and not only uh, uh, just for commerce, it is the importance is that it has to be, uh, it has to have uh, regard to the heritage of that area. So, the renovation of the house fronts is an important part of that and legal and administrative measures are very important. Partnering with the organization, so one of the major focus of this is partnering with the organization at the locals and the leaders at the local, city and the state and the national level. Main Street America protects the historic character of the cities and town across the country and promotes shared prosperity. Uh, where it is talking about the prosperity of the owners, prosperity of the uh, residents, prosperity of the city as a whole and uh, this is uh, another different dimension. But one of the major uh, ideas to protect the historic character of the city. Comprehensive, inclusive, place based and people focused approach. Comprehensive, inclusive, place based and people is not driving away the people from that area. It is not an exclusive, it is an inclusive approach and it is a comprehensive that again that holistic approach. 
we have seen uh, Warsaw, uh, we have seen the reconstructed area. So, here it is just outside the reconstructed area, uh, which is uh, uh, this is the old reconstructed city part, and when we are talking about this, this is just outside the historic core, but this is also has its own history, later history different types of structure very much lived in the vehicles are allowed, uh, but there is a control and there are offices, there are uh, academic institutes, there are residential neighborhoods and other and uh, there are the different types of street furniture you see the lamp post and the, uh, the green areas which are again are a different type. So, we are talking about the core area and then outside that area. So, it actually sort of a helps in a transition from uh, uh, different the layers of history through the different types of control and rules and regulations. But let us see what is happening in India. Uh, let us see this examples Bhuvaneshwar, Ekamra Khetra, old city of Bhuvaneshwar area, uh, Orissa and there where we can see that there is the Lingaraj temple, we can see through the double story there is some control that is why um, the, the very high rise structures have not come in that old city area. This is from Hyderabad, the jail khana in Monda market Hyderabad. Uh, it has the area as a whole as its own identity, the distinct features and uh, how do we uh, sort of cope up with this area, so that the significance of that area is preserved that is really a challenge. Can we learn from this convention of the historic district or something being done in this area? I, uh, the city authorities what are they doing for uh, or are they we are losing that area? Uh, this has to be seen. Now, we are coming back to Calcutta again. Calcutta, this is Tarjipara. I think we have discussed this example in Indi uh, Indian scenario, and uh, this is uh, as a distinct the traditional neighborhood, uh, which again has a beautiful uh, group of buildings um, and uh, different pattern of movement, uh, the layers of history, um, the social uh, neighborhood ties are very strong in that area. It has been preserved, it has not been declared as a special heritage district just uh, by uh, certain uh, sort of a norms, unwritten norms and things they are still preserved. There are heritage works, people understand the value of that area not only as a visual physical fabric, but also the different life form. Um, uh, and I will talk about that possibly the different artists are now working in that area making people aware of the significance of people are very proud of those area, but many other activities are also happening. But what is uh, to be concerned about that, that this is what is happening that suddenly we see uh, new structures are coming up which is of a, a different pattern altogether, the setback is different, there is a front setback, the height is different, the architectural character is different and we are not saying that we have to imitate or copy the older structures, but it does not have any, uh, ha they are not in harmony with that and uh, so it fails to uh, have a dialogue with the old and the new. But what is required in such area as we have seen that uh, the that instruments that it should be declared as a heritage district. So, there has to be a special bylaws and uh, that is what is a challenge of the Indian cities. We will continue with our next lecture some of the Indian scenario uh, is not that people are not aware of people uh, the local peoples are aware of the even the city authorities been uh, aware of the challenges and what is happening. So, we will see some of the examples and the challenges and issues of the heritage district and historic areas in an Indian context. Thank you.